I was a professor of art and the head of the art department at Northern Kentucky University. I liked my job very much. It was um, a lot of responsibility, very rewarding, a lot of fun, and um, real ego fulfilling, which was what my whole life was about, was uh, you know, career, job, be somebody, get your name in the paper, you know. Um, and you were also known as a skeptic. Right. Um, I was well known, in fact, that um, some people brought their relatives to me to talk them out of going into the ministry and in the priesthood. And you did. Uh-huh. And so, as you were cruising along, uh, chairman of the department and so on, uh, you took your students to France, and what happened over there? At the end of our trip in 1985, I had a perforation of the small stomach, and I was immediately taken to a hospital. This is a situation like a um, burst appendix, same kind of situation. Um, you only have a few hours of opportunity before it becomes very grave, um, it's a critical scene. I thought I was dying. My wife thought I was dying. We had said goodbye to each other. And I awoke, and I was standing next to the bed, and in the bed was a body that looked exactly like me, but I couldn't believe it because I felt alive, whole, real, no pain, though. I tried to communicate with my wife. She um, couldn't see me or hear me, but I didn't know that. I thought she was ignoring me. I got furious with her. I'm really confused about what's going on. And I hear people calling me outside the room. And so I go over to the doorway of the room, and there's a number of people out there, and I ask them if they're the hospital staff to take me for the operation, and they said that they had been waiting for me a long time, that I needed to hurry up and come with them. I assumed that meant they were hospital staff. I went into the hallway. It was um, foggy, uh, dreary, mysterious. These people herded me down this hallway. We walked for what seemed like miles and miles. It got increasingly dark. The people were getting increasingly ugly and cruel. And I, I wanted out, so I said, I'm not going any further. They started to push and pull at me. I fought back. I felt really strong and healthy. Um, no fatigue whatsoever, but they were biting and tearing and taunting and jeering. The cacophony of noise was almost unbearable. It was so loud with their taunts and their yells and their laughter. When and did I, you realize the, you weren't in the hospital, this was something else? At this point, I still think I'm in the hospital. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, I'm alive, and these people are some monsters that live in this hospital. You know, mm -hmm. I'm on the ground of that place. They've done so much damage to me that I'm just curled up lying on the ground, totally devastated physically, and even worse, emotionally, because of their treatment. And I hear myself say, pray to God. I, I, don't, I don't know what to do, and I don't believe in God. And I hear myself say it again. I'm not willing, willfully saying it, but I, I'm hearing my own voice say, pray to God. And I think, how do you pray to God? What, what would you pray if you were going to pray a third time? With more authority, I hear, pray to God. So I go, OK, I'm going to give it a try. I don't, you know, I don't know what to do. So I'm trying to piece together prayers, and I'm putting together pieces of the Pledge of Allegiance, the Lord's Prayer, the 20th, any things that I can remember from 20, 30 years earlier when I was a kid. And the people around me are horrified. It's as if my prayers are scalding, boiling oil. And they're screaming and yelling at me, stop it, there's no God, nobody can hear me. This is when I realize this is not Paris anymore. This is, I don't know where I am, but there's no place on earth with this much cruelty. And in that state of like hopelessness, because there's no place for me to go, they're going to come back, they're going to make it worse, I heard in my mind myself as a little child singing, Jesus loves me, Lord. and it goes over and over and over. And in my desperation, I want to believe, I don't know Jesus, but I want to know this what this little boy knows is trustworthy and good, that I've forgotten, that I've lost, that I had once when I was a little kid, and I want to know that. And so in, in utter despair but sincerity, I call out into the darkness, Jesus, please save me. And I meant it. Ignorant, but I meant it. And with that, a small light appeared to the darkness, and a person of incredible, brilliant light and love and kindness came upon me and carried me out of that place of horror and took me not to heaven, but just out of there. And 
showed me my whole life from when I was little to when I was adult, from when I was simple and innocent and good, and how I had become manipulative, self-centered, corrupt, and successful in the world. Got about, uh, a, minute, got about a minute left. Okay. So? And he invited my questions. I told him um, all of my questions. He answered my questions, sent me back into this world. And when I came back into this world, I knew that I would have to remake my life. I didn't hardly know where to begin, but one of the things that weighed very heavily on my heart was I wanted to go to church because he told me that's where the truth was taught. That's where his spirit was lived and built in the world. And I went to church and I found people there trying to live this truth, trying to be this truth, trying to bring that spirit into their lives, you know, the spirit of Christ to abide in them. And I wanted to dedicate my life to that, so unfortunately I had to give up a good job that I loved as a professor, and I quit that and went to seminary and became the pastor of a small church in Cincinnati, Ohio.